Okay, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Why don't we uh, open with prayer? Father, thank you for all the things that you provide in our lives. You are, uh, we're wowed and amazed at how your heart is toward us and how generous you are to us and that the very next breath that we breathe is in your hand. And we just thank you for being our Lord and our God and thank you so much for what you do in our lives. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Christ. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who teaches us all, all things about him. Teach us today by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been talking about the different gifts of the Spirit, and we're at this one particular one called to another, the discerning of spirits. And the this particular one, I think, uh, gets kind of overlooked because there's so much scrutiny given to some of the other ones, like healing and miracles and prophecy and tongues and stuff like that. But this is really an interesting one because um, um, it, 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 it seems relatively straightforward. It, and it, I, I think it is once we understand what it's about. You know, one of the things about the gifts of the Spirit that's really interesting to me is that um, if we're in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to us. And... I don't think the Holy Spirit just gives a person a single gift. Some, I think the Holy Spirit is willing to use anybody for anything if they're willing to believe. But I think because of the way that we're made, we kind of function in some aspects of them, e even by nature. I mean, you know, we may not always prophesy outright, but there are plenty of times that we had just a sense of knowing that something's going to happen, and it happened. Or, you know, maybe we don't go around laying hands on everybody and praying that God will heal them in, in that, you know, extreme sense and see limbs grow out and stuff like that. But there are plenty of times in our life where somebody is heartbroken or somebody just needs comfort, somebody needs society. And we find that we're there with them and for them and it comforts their soul. It gives them healing. So, see, I think our nature is to function in the gifts of the Spirit even if we don't even believe them. It is the way we're made. And so if we understand that God made us that way and we believe in the power of his Holy Spirit, I believe God will use his spirit a lot more in our lives simply by recognizing that, that fact. That may be me. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, I want to I wanna talk about this discerning of the spirit because it spirit means pneumo it comes from the the greek word pneumatic it means wind or breath or spirit and the word discerning means pretty much what you would think it means to distinguish like um deciding or judgment to pass sentence on be like a judge or a jury evaluating the facts to determine if the story is true or if it's not true I mean, when you stop and think about discerning of spirits, you know, one of the first ones that comes to mind was what uh, happened to Daniel. Remember, Daniel was a Jew who was in the Babylonian exile. And during that 70-year exile, there were a number of kings that ruled over Babylon. It was Nebuchadnezzar and then Belshazzar, and then you had Darius, and you had uh, a couple others, Xerxes, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the one that took the Israelites into captivity. His son Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, Belshazzar became king after Nebuchadnezzar died. So Belshazzar threw this big feast, and uh, they were all sitting around partying and everything. And uh, the king says, hey, why don't we bring out all the gold and silver vessels that we uh, captured from uh, the the take over of Jerusalem and uh, the siege of Jerusalem and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll use them and our wives and our concubines can drink from them. And so they did. And they brought them out. Everybody started drinking in them and they um, started worshiping their gods at the same time. They were, they were praising gods of gold and of silver and bronze and wood and stone. Now remember, these vessels were sanctified. 
for temple use. They were the vessels from the temple. And all the vessels in the temple, Moses set apart for temple use. That's what sanctification means, set apart for a specific use. And I think in the eyes of the Lord, it was an absolute mockery of what God had sanctified for the temple use. So, um, while they were reveling and worshiping, right in front of Belshazzar, a hand appears and starts writing on the wall right in front of him. Scripture says that uh, it terrified him. His hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other is what the scripture said. I bet his teeth were rattling and he couldn't, he couldn't stand. He was so scared. I mean, think about it, guys. If you're sitting there and you see a hand appear and start writing on the wall, you might be a tad spooked too. Well, you know, they're, they were very you know, superstitious people. They were, they were polytheistic. They worship a lot of gods, so they read a lot. They they were spooked about a lot of things. There's a lot of mysticism there. Well, this one is obviously one that would get your attention. So he calls together his enchanters and his astrologers and his diviners. And he said, uh, he, he, he said that if anyone could interpret what was written, he would clothe in purple, which is a sign of royalty, and he would give them a golden necklace and be third in the kingdom. That's a pretty good deal. Pretty good billet if you can get it. Well, they came, but nobody can interpret the writing. And the king was pretty distraught about the whole thing. Well, the queen, and we don't know her name, but she remembered Daniel. So apparently she knew of Daniel, one of the times of Nebuchadnezzar. And um, she told the king that he was in, in great favor with Nebuchadnezzar for interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar had put Daniel in charge of all the magicians and all the diviners, all of the astrologers. He put them over every one of them. Here's what she told him in Daniel um, 5, 11 through 12. There is a man in your kingdom, the queen's talking to Belshazzar, there's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King, King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. So the, the queen obviously knew of this guy, Daniel, and thought, must have thought pretty highly of, highly of him. But this is what she observed based on what Daniel did. She recognized that the spirit of the holy God was in him. She was a pagan and recognized that because of the wisdom and the interpretation, the ability to do these you know, understanding dreams and interpreting things and having knowledge and wisdom. You know, I guess... From one perspective, even though she was a pagan, she was able to rightly discern the spirit. She recognized, a pagan recognized that this man had the spirit of the living God in him. I mean, it starts to give us a little indication of what we're looking for when we're looking at discerning of spirits. So, Daniel's called. And the king told him that he heard of Daniel's reputation, and he made Daniel the same offer. Well, Daniel wouldn't bite. In fact, when you read, when you read this story, you kind of get the impression that Daniel didn't much care for Belshazzar in the first place. Here's, he, he's, he tells him to keep his gifts and give them to another. And he told him that, that King Nebuchadnezzar's father had given him, Belshazzar, a great kingdom of majesty, glory, and honor. He became prideful. He was deposed, being Nebuchadnezzar, he was deposed and was fed grass like an ox and was put out literally to pasture. He, he had some sort of a disease where he'd go out and he thought he was an ox or a cow and he was eating grass. It's an amazing story when you read about Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Daniel goes on, he says, You, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself even though 
you knew all these things happened to your father. I mean, Josh is always sitting there observing everything that happened to Nebuchadnezzar, his father. Yet by drinking from the temple's vessels, he lifted himself above God and in the process worshiped false gods. And he says, you know, you, you, you aren't even giving glory to God who holds the very breath that you're breathing in his hands. I mean, this guy was cocky, he was proud, he wasn't recognizing God or giving glory to God. So, God decides to give him a little note. And his hand appears, and he starts writing on the wall. Here's what he writes. Daniel 5, 25-29 says, And this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upsalom. This is the interpretation of each word. See, this is what Daniel was interpreting. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, or Upsalom, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. I mean, he just <laughs> interpreted Belshazzar's doom. And I guess that Belshazzar must have thought that he could find some favor with God if he exalted Daniel. Didn't work out that way. But in, in Hebrew, now look, nobody there could interpret these words. Nobody there in Babylon could. Now when I look up these words, I look them up in Aramaic or in Hebrew because this was Old Testament. So I don't know, I don't, if these were Jewish words or Hebrew words or Aramaic words, there was obviously nobody in Babylon that could read Hebrew. Or this was a different language. We'll talk about that next week when we're talking about tongues. But um, he, he writes these words. Mene means a weight or a measurement. Tekel means two way. And parson or upshalom means to break or into or divide. So four words. The message for the guy's whole life. It doesn't take God saying a lot of things to you to change the trajectory of you. I mean, he could say one word to you and change everything. That's how powerful the words of God are. So here's what happened. Daniel 5, 33, 31 says, That very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. That very night, God, God judged him, wrote on the wall. That very night, he's taken out. Who did the discerning of spirits here? Was it Daniel? No, Daniel was just Daniel was just reading the writing. God was actually doing the discerning of spirits here. He was discerning the heart of, Bel of, of Belshazzar. And basically he was just saying, look, here's your heart. You're cocky and you're proud and you disregard the very God who holds his, your next breath in his hand. And you're going to be judged for that. God discerns his heart discerns his spirit. So we need to understand Jeremiah wrote something that's really important. In Jeremiah 17, 10, he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. Now, we need to remember that under grace, when God tests the heart, he gives us a new heart when we receive Christ. So that's how we have favor with him is because when he looks at our heart, he sees the heart that he's given us. But he also tests our, you know, he also, he also evaluates our minds. He, want, he wants us to make sure that we're thinking of the right things. He wants us to make sure we're thinking of him. That's how our minds get tested these days. You know, a lot of, a lot of people pray, Lord, search my heart and find if there's evil, any evil way in me. That's an Old Testament prayer. We've got a new heart, and we have the mind of Christ. So we just need to remember that. So one of the, you know, we, I've talked about this multiple times. You know, one of the things that uh, is really the labor that Christians should be in is to labor to enter into the Lord's rest, to, to, to labor to enter into an understanding of who we are in Christ. Because if we do that, we will find that sin becomes 
pretty much a non-issue and we aren't struggling to earn what we would never be able to earn in the first place. Favor from God. Justify our salvation. Anyway, the Holy Spirit comes inside. So, you know, what, what exactly does the Holy Spirit do? Um, I think understanding what the motivation is of the, of the gift of the Spirit is, is the first thing. The Holy Spirit, remember, gives us gifts for the edification of everyone, for the benefit of everyone. And we also need to understand what the, the heart of discernment of spirit is. I think John made it very clear what the heart of it is. In John, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, he says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Okay, well, how do we do that? He says, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. That's the test. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. What a simple test. It's not whether somebody proclaims that they're religious. It's not that somebody proclaims that they go to church every Sunday and Wednesday night. It's not... You know, I go to you know, I go to vacation Bible school every summer and missions every summer. It's not any of that. It's not that I feed the poor. It's not that I, you know, visit people in jail. It's not any of that. It's my spirit confessing that God Himself incarnated as a man and came in the flesh on the earth to die for me. That is the spirit of Christ. If somebody's unwilling to recognize that, and if they don't recognize it, they're not going to confess it, then that's the spirit of Antichrist. And we need to understand the difference. You know, there was a lot of things that people said about Jesus. He was a good man. He was a prophet. He was a good teacher. That may not necessarily be the spirit of Christ if that's all they believe about Christ. Either Jesus is what he says he was, or he was one of the biggest deceivers that ever lived. He's either God or he's a liar. So, you know, we need to make that distinction. Jesus isn't, wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a good prophet. That's got nothing to do with it. Jesus is God incarnate. See, people might recognize or say that he was a good man or a good teacher, but... They, they may not acknowledge that he was sent by the Father and is now resurrected. So we have spirits out there that will try to deceive. They'll try to sound religious to get us deceived. In fact, I think religion is the biggest counterfeit the devil ever came up with to a relationship with God. I despise it. I was talking to somebody the other day who doesn't believe in God at all. And we were talking and he said, I don't think much about religion. I said, I don't either. I don't. I don't have time to waste on that. But I sure do like taking time and spending it with my Lord because that's relationship. I can't imagine what it would be like to not have a relationship with God. I mean, man, how hopeless, how purposelessness is that? But my perspective of God is as best I can interpret that he loves me. And therefore, I have a loving relationship with my Heavenly Father. I don't have one of terror. Do I, am, do, am I completely in awe of Him and inspired? Yes. Could He take me out in an instant? Absolutely. But that goes against everything that He teaches me about why Jesus came in the first place. For God so loved the world. I'm not the world. I was in the world. Jesus Christ came and died for those who hated him. He came when we were his enemy and died for us. So when I look at that, when I look at his, his nature and his heart through that lens, it makes me want to have a relationship with him. You understand that the very breath that he was holding in his hand for Belshazzar, he holds in the same respect with us. The very next breath we breathe, even if we use it to curse God, is a gift from God. 
And he's a good guy. So, we need to understand and discern spirits. I think discernment of spirits starts right there. Hey, are you glorifying Jesus? And let me tell you why that is the test. If you're, if, you're, if you're looking at it from a different perspective, if you're not confessing that Jesus Christ in the flesh, you're deceived. Jesus explained what the Holy Spirit was going to do and what he would do when he came. Now remember, it's the Spirit that gives these gifts, right? It is the Spirit that gives the gift of discerning of spirits. So Jesus is talking, and you know, first of all, we need to understand, Jesus came in the flesh, he's resurrected. He talked about people being deceived. You know, they'll, they'll say, Jesus is over here, or Jesus is over there. You know, don't be deceived. Why? Because Jesus already came, and he resurrected. And this next time he's coming, it's not going to be he's going to be sitting over there on the chair waiting for people to come chat with him. He's coming like lightning, and we're going to be taken up, snatched up, and going to be with him forever. We're going to be caught up with him, and he's going to take us home. And listen, the other, the other prong of this discernment of spirit is there's no deceit in the, in the spirit of Christ. It's true. Remember, Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. There is nothing that Jesus ever says or does, ever said or did, that is a lie. Nothing. Everything he ever said was the truth. Everything he ever did was the truth. So there's no deceit in the spirit of Christ. In fact, here's what Jesus said of the spirit when he was telling the disciples that he was going to go away, but he was going to send the comforter. In John 16, 13 through 15, he says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Do you understand? He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and the only thing that he's going to do is to glorify me. The Holy Spirit is going to focus us on Jesus. That's why when discerning of spirits, you know it, it is a spirit of Christ if Christ is being exalted. If Christ is not being exalted, but some man is or some prophet is or some event is, they're missing it. And they're deceived. The true test is whether the Spirit is glorifying Jesus and he will only speak about those things of Jesus. That is the litmus test. I mean, there's been a lot of people talking to us about the name of Jesus. But a, a, to discern the spirit, the question is, is what they're saying glorifying Jesus? Do they really have the spirit of Christ? That's how you discern the spirit. And, and if, they, if it's not the spirit of Christ, guess what? It's the spirit of Antichrist. John made it pretty clear. It's kind of a zero-sum game. Which makes sense. It's just like sin and uh, it's just like life and, and death is the same thing as life and judgment in the sense that there's only one source of life, Jesus Christ. You know, and the Father. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, God, three in one. There's only one source of life. And if we choose that life, we are choosing life. If we choose God, we choose life. If we reject God, what are we what are we choosing? Yeah, there's nothing left. It is a zero-sum game. Same thing with the Spirit. You're either exalting Jesus or you're just being religious. That's why I marvel sometimes. I hear sermons, and I really don't listen to a lot of sermons anymore. I just don't. I mean, I, I, it, it's like if they mention Jesus at all, I use him as a spice. Just sprinkle him on a little bit or whatever they're saying. Guys, Jesus is the main core. I mean, you take Jesus out of the Bible, all you got is an interesting history book. I mean, it really is that simple. There's a lot of facets about Jesus that we need to understand. But if it's not, if we don't look at everything through the lens of Jesus Christ is everything and we are nothing, we're missing it. 
You know, I don't bring anything to the table in my relationship with the Lord other than just believe, and even that's a gift from him. It's not Jesus Christ 70% and me 30. It's not him getting me saved and leaving it up to me to do the rest of the work. It's not him 99% and me 1%. It's Jesus Christ 100% and me nothing. Now, there's one other instance I was thinking of when I was preparing for this about testing of the Spirit. Uh, in Acts, Philip, remember Philip was the one that had gone and po- spoken with the Ethiopian eunuch and then was translated uh, uh, 27 miles away to Ashdod by the power of the Holy Spirit. That was pretty cool, I thought. Supernatural transport sounds kind of fun. Well, anyway, he goes up to Samaria and he's preaching and a lot of people believed and were baptized. Well, when the, uh, uh, the other disciples heard this, they sent Peter and John to go up there because they were going to lay their hands on them so they could receive the Holy Spirit. And there was this uh, sorcerer up there by the name of Simon. And Simon had heard Philip. I mean, he, he was a sorcerer, so he had done some things that really caused people to think that he was some sort of great guy. Well, anyway, he goes up there. Uh, Simon listens to Philip, and he, he, he believes, and he's baptized. And when uh, Peter and John go up there, they, he sees that they, they're laying their hands on people and receiving the Holy Spirit. And Simon offers them money to have that ability to lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. He tries to buy the free gift. You know, that's a whole other message about the deception of religion. The idea that we got to work for the favor that God gives us freely. You know, you can't buy the gift of God. Well, anyway, Peter sees him. He says this, Acts 8, 20 through 24. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. What's the, what's the point here? Peter recognized that this man was wanting the free gift from God for selfish motivations, for selfish reasons. Remember, we say this repeatedly in this series. Paul wrote that the Holy Spirit gives gifts for the edification, the lifting up of, and the benefit of all of us. It is not for our self-aggrandizement. It is for the church. It is so that we will grow in the Lord. We'll be mature. We'll have a clear, found, uh, solid foundation on, on which we stand. It's got nothing to do with us individually. Just because I may have this gift doesn't mean I'm any better than this next person that has the other gift. The Holy Spirit can take it away just as easily as he gives it. It's like the whole idea of uh, evangelism. You know, you know, I, I led somebody to the Lord. I, you know, it's like you're making a little chip mark so you can go up and prove to the Lord that you're worthy to go to heaven. Paul wrote, made it very clear. He said, one man plants and another man waters, but that makes no difference. It is God who brings the increase. My gift makes no difference if I'm doing things selfishly with it. Well, that's what happened to Simon. And I mean, Peter didn't, being Peter, <laughs> he just lowered the boom on the guy. Simon wanted the power for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but he was full of greed and envy. That is not the Holy Spirit, and that's what Peter saw. See, Simon wanted to glorify himself. The test of the Spirit is glorifying who? Jesus. That's the test. And that's what Simon was not doing. The discerning of of spirits is a gift that clearly sees whether a spirit is glorifying Jesus or not. It's that simple. So to me, it, it, it is an incredibly miraculous gift, but it's an incredibly simple one. To me, it's very clear. Maybe I have that because I, it makes sense to me. It's like if it's not the spirit of Christ, it's, it's, not, it's the spirit of Antichrist. That's the discerning of spirits. 
So, you know, that's the thing in the church. We need to understand that. So when we hear all these crazy doctrines that come floating through, we'll recognize the lie, right? We better pray. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit who does teach us and helps us to see very clearly um, and helps us to discern whether the Spirit is of Christ or of not. Let that Spirit flow freely, uh, just flow freely in our body, Lord, in Jesus' name.